Let's call this meeting to order. It's Thursday, August 15th. Uh, the time is 4.30 p.m. Commissioners present are President Wardell Giraducci, Commissioner Lee, Maul, Dunning, Wolf, and Wong, and Commissioner Ono is excused. Thank you very much, Secretary Blackman. Um, welcome to the August 15th meeting of the San Francisco Public Library Commission. Um, we're uh, excited to have you here. Uh, the agenda, along with supplemental information, is on the back um, area there. So if you haven't picked it up already, we're going to move uh, forward as our agenda has been set forth today. We are going to begin um, our meeting um, with a general public comment. And at this particular time, I invite individuals who have any general public comment to come to the podium. Good afternoon, Commission and fellow library lovers. Uh, my name is Catherine Domaney. Uh, I live in Dogpatch. And um, I handed out a little document called um, the Dog Patch Hub, a proposal. Um, this is a proposal for a community center library facility in Dog Patch neighborhood. I've had the pleasure of meeting um, both Michael and Maureen a couple times um, to discuss this idea. And I just wanted to bring it to you so that you're aware of what we're working on over in the east side of town. Um, basically, we need a program partner to serve our growing and very diverse uh, neighborhood and we would like it to be a city family agency in order to sustain and steward the facility into the future. We have a building. We have $6.7 million that we've raised. We have an experienced design partner, a build team in place. We have momentum and full community support. Um, why Dogpatch? Dogpatch is the nexus of a crossroads of, in the heart of the city's development boom. The population has quintupled since 2010, topping 8,500 today. And at 10 years, Dogpatch will probably be one of the most, the densest communities in the neighborhood. Um, we'll already have quintupled our population by 2022 when we intend to open. Um, we have what we have community need. Our neighbors um, need a communal space. We've never had one in order to meet and emerge in a new way. Um, we lack historic resources. The first library, the second library of the city of San Francisco opened in Dogpatch. Back in um, the 1800s, it closed in 1902. We've had nothing since then. Um, our branch mod remodel in Petro Hill happened in 2010, and it's a beautiful facility, but it, can, it can't handle the population we have. We have very limited teen resources, an even smaller community room than we had in the old facility. Um, and the two neighboring facilities we have in Mission Bay and Bayview, Mission Bay is already too small and will be even smaller for that growing community, and Bayview is over two miles away. Um, new development in Dogpatch. We have an immense amount of need right now in Dogpatch. Uh, the slide that I'm showing you has over uh, 1,600 new housing units that are already built, that have been built in the last year. Um, and even uh, there's a quote from 2018 from the uh, library officials stating there might need, be need for uh, five additional branches in the southeast sector. Um, opportunity, we have a building. And Mark, my colleague on the board, is going to talk to you about that. It's um, in Crane Cove Park, facing uh, onto the water. The, it's a port facility, and they are working with us hand in hand to um, sign the lease and get this thing built as soon as possible. Hi, commissioners. Thank you for hearing us today. Um, I am also a commissioner on the Small Business Commission, and uh, I own a business in Dogpatch, and I live there as well. And uh, our, I've been there for 12 years now, and we've experienced incredible growth, as you may or may not know. Do you mind stating your name for the record? Oh, sorry. Mark Dwight, uh, resident and business owner in Dogpatch, Small Business Commissioner. Um, we've had a tremendous amount of growth, and we continue to have more growth with the Pier 70 and ultimately the power plant uh, projects coming online with uh, lots of residential growth. And uh, so what we're here advocating for is a community center that we want to build and w um, having you as our partner uh, in this endeavor. So we do, as Catherine uh, mentioned, have a uh, building identified. It's on port property. Um, they are very interested and keen on us um, doing the renovation of that building and activating the space. It faces a new park called Crane Cove Park, which you may have heard of. Uh, 
there's a couple of cranes there. That's where it gets its uh, name from, and it's an old uh, uh, industrial area where uh, ships were loaded. Um, we raised $4.2 million from UCSF as part of their cushioning uh, as they've moved uh, into our neighborhood from Mission Bay. And so uh, they've, they're funding a large part of this. We've also secured $2.5 million from the uh, Pier 70 development. So um, we have some incremental fundraising to do, but we're well along the way. Uh, we have an experienced design partner, TEF. Uh, TEF has done several uh, remodels of libraries already, so they're very uh, familiar with the um, space planning for library type spaces, and especially new libraries. Not so much book libraries, but uh, spaces that can be activated in ways that uh, you guys are activating your spaces in the community today. Uh, the concept is basically a community living room. Um, we need a meeting space for our community meetings. Uh, we also need a place for um, all ages uh, to convene, whether they be youth for after-school programs, uh, adults for uh, adult programs, and seniors uh, for um, later, life, later in life programs. So um, TEF is working with us to create a flexible space that will allow us to meet all those needs. We have a, a board of community uh, activists and, um, and residents, so we're, we're um, already embedded in the community and done a lot of outreach with the various organizations in our community, which include a very active neighborhood association and business association. So uh, we have a very active neighborhood in Dogpatch. We're a historic district, so we spend a lot of time uh, negotiating with developers to preserve our historic nature, and so uh, we've been, and I've been very impressed with how active the neighborhood is. Um, we have um, also, of course, have the support of uh, organizations like uh, the Giants and the Warriors who are moving into our neighborhood. Is that 30 seconds or three minutes? That's three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we, we get a little uh, warning in our commission meeting. <laughs> Thank you very much. I look forward to telling you more in the future. Thank you very much. Further public comment? We're, uh, for those of you that just walked in, we're on our agenda item number one for public comment. Good afternoon, I'm Peter Warfield, Executive Director of Library Users Association. It's good to hear some folks wanting from some things from libraries, uh, and from this one in particular. Um, we wanted something earlier this year and were, uh, if you like, successful in uh, the library doing it, and that is we were concerned that you were doing the absolute minimum on fees and uh, you did what we asked for, which is to extend your fine-free uh, proposal to the supervisors to include what fines were owing and on the books, not just fines going forward. So I wish you would also uh, continue that line and in that direction and follow what we have been speaking about very strongly for years and which you have assiduously avoided in today's agenda as well as in previous discussions. And that is the issue of fees. This library, whose first word in its slogan is free, free and equal access, is not free if you make a whole lot of either mistakes, uh, I mean, any number of mistakes, or, uh, well, ordinary things as well, like copies and so on and so forth, fees for the use of rooms when it goes beyond the use of the room and so on and so forth. Fees, in particular lost material fees, can hurt people very, very badly. Typically, there's hardly any book or material that you could lose, even one of, and not have more than $10 uh, owing. If you have more than $10 owing at this library, you can't borrow any physical material at all, books, DVDs, CDs, and the like. And those fees, for example, for lost books, can hit you very suddenly, very hard. If you lose uh, several books in a bag at once, or if you drop them into a wet gutter, uh, all of a sudden, 35, 35 times 2, 70, 35 times 10, 350, all of a sudden, you're owing a lot of money. And just as money-free or non-money bail has been discussed in the last year or two very strongly as something that's unjust, especially for poor people and minorities. You've, you've understood that fines 
hurt people who are the poorest and the minorities the most. Fees do exactly the same thing, and I think it's just appalling that you have not included a study of fees and a plan to get rid of money fees, which hurt all kinds of people, including kids who for 45 years have not had to pay overdue fines. If you're a kid and you lose, or if you're a senior and lose, you're stuck with a big fee and maybe can't use the library if you can't pay. You should consider those as well as fines. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment? Hi, I'm Marie Cipella, Executive Director of Friends of the San Francisco Public Library. I just really quickly wanted to tell you that we now have our poster for the big book sale, which will start uh, September, God, what is it, 18. Um, they'll go up on bus shelters fairly soon. I just wanted to let you all know I left some in the back as well. And uh, we're just also really excited about the Middle Ground exhibition outside. It was a great opening. And we're just really happy that we could partner also with uh, the library and the exploratorium to make sure that the, the young folks who are the proctors or, or working in the site are, are going to be able to get their stipends. So we're really delighted with the great partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment? All right, seeing that there is none, we're going to move on to our agenda item number two, which is a presentation on the partnership between the San Francisco Unified School District and the San Francisco Public Library. Um, and we will have a commission um, discussion about this um, after our, our public comment state, uh, uh, phase. Thank you, President Wardell, and good evening, commissioners. As the city's young people enter their, will re-enter their classrooms next week to begin a new academic year, library staff wanted to take this opportunity to highlight the incredible partnership that we enjoy with the San Francisco Unified School District. We're strong partners in education, heavily invested in the success of San Francisco's youth, and it's my pleasure to introduce Christy Estrovitz, our youth services manager for the library. She's also our liaison to the school district. And we're also honored to have Kevin Truitt, Associate Superintendent for SFUSD present this evening as well. Christy? Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity to brag a little bit about our growing partnership. So again, my name is Christy Estrovitz, and I have the honor of managing youth services for the San Francisco Public Library. And I'm really grateful to be joined by our, our long-standing partner, um, Kevin Truitt from SFUSD. Um, there are three distinct, distinctive features about our partnership with the public school. It is one that they are one district, unlike some of our peer cities where there are 19 districts. So we have one go-to district and a designated partner. Secondly, we have internal organizational structure where we at the public library have a dedicated youth librarian, often a team, at every single location. And our partners at SFUSD, through their funding, have a dedicated teacher librarian at their sites too. So we have a natural go-to partner at every level. This is truly distinctive for San Francisco, um, where we see in Chicago, uh, one of our peer libraries, they don't have school librarians anymore. Oakland has very, very few, so we are uniquely positioned to succeed and grow our partnership. And thirdly, it's Kevin Truitt. He has <laughs> been our longstanding partner um, through my predecessor and currently over 14 years, we've had him as our advocate, um, being equally persistent in our endeavors and just a true library champion. And you may ask, like, how long is this partnership? Well, this summer, actually just a couple of weeks ago, we found these archive photos of an SFUSD teacher librarian and public librarian meeting. Wow. That's 52 years and counting. So just let that sink in. Because I've always been curious, like, how long has this partnership been going on? So now we have evidence. And I welcome anyone to identify this location. Um, the note on the file where we found this from said board room. It doesn't look quite like a board room, and it doesn't quite look like our library, so please help me investigate this. 
Now on to our partnership. Um, this is what it looks like today. So just two hours ago, I was meeting with the teacher librarians, K through 12, very similar faces in this group, sharing their love of the library and really like getting them ready for the school year. We know that when the school closes for the summer, we are on fire. We are ready for these students, and now we're ready to send them back and see them in the after school hours. Mm -hmm. And this is just one of the quotes from the teacher librarian at um, Dolores Huerta um, Elementary School, talking about you know being our partner for research projects, community outreach, really connecting families, not just the student, but the whole family to resources. So we are grateful for partners like this. And these partners were kind of our guinea pig when we launched the teacher card five years ago. We did a quick um, email to our teacher librarian friends and said, hey, an educator friends, like send us a selfie with your library card. We got over 25 pictures in an hour from our partners showing off their SFPL library card. So this is a perk for any educator in San Francisco. They get extended borrowing privileges, so that's double the usual adult access. Um, double the amount of items checking out for their classroom use, no overdue fees, no fines moving forward, and um, just direct access. So this is a perk that teachers really, really take advantage of. We have about 4,000 teacher library card, teacher educator cards at our library. One thing that I'm particularly most proud of is our scholar card initiative, which launched um, three years ago with at Tenderloin Community School with Pre Principal Shatner, Kevin Truett was there, our leadership team, Dr. Mary was there. The Connect Ed program, or Scholar Card is based on the Connect Ed program um, commissioned um, by President Obama to make sure that students have access to library resources. So we took that very seriously and launched the Scholar Card. This is our equity program, so every single student at SFUSD has access to the library. I'm going to play this PSA to <laughs> A scholar card is a special type of library card that can connect you to millions, millions, millions of free resources. It allows you to see all kinds of cool stuff. I think it's like in the millions, I think. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> who can get a scholar card? People who go to public schools in San Francisco. Any student in the SFUSD can get one. What is a major perk of the Scholar Card? It's a place like office way for card activation. Let's say you have this huge fee that you need to give to the library. Well, if you get a Scholar Card, it's gone. So if you had like $100 on your old one, then you don't have to pay it. That's cool, I know. Right? What can you get with your Scholar Cards? Books, graphic novels, music, and movies. Computers and Wi-Fi, online workout, language learning tools, museum classes, streaming, movies, and music. Oh, you knew that? You can even get e-books. E-news, magazine, e-magazine, anything that begins with an E. A lowercase e. <laughs> Ooh, that's cool. How much is a scholar card? It is all for free. All for free. It's all for free. That's my favorite <laughs> part. All for free! using the Scholar Card. Where can you get a Scholar Card? At any San Francisco Public Library. Scholar card. And so far we've activated 65% of all SFUSD students. Two thirds of these are actively using the library, using our resources, accessing Wi Fi, um, connecting with computers, and probably coming to a lot of public programming too. So we're on the campaign to make sure that all students have this access and we'll continue to work this school year doing this. 
So again, when school's out for the summer, the library's open, we have thousands of free STEM programs, and we are so proud to partner with our teacher librarians, English teachers, to create an annual summer reading list. This is recommended, fun books, it's super diverse, available in many different languages, and we do a direct mail to all SFUSD students. So not only they get this information, but also their families get this information about what's happening at the library and how to get involved this summer. Another special event that happens right here, this will happen on October, we partner with LitQuake and we host KidQuake. So that's two mornings with a thousand students coming in for assemblies to hear real authors talk about real books and writing stories. There really doesn't get much better than that. It connects readers with stories and really plants the seeds for finding their own story. It's super inspiring and it's a lot of fun to host. This was our, the coordinator, Summer. She just said this was one of our best. She says that every year, but last year was pretty distinctive. So we're looking forward to what this year brings. And I, we're only days away before school resumes, so I want to share our top three best resources, besides our youth librarians, of course, is our homework help, and administered by BrainFuse. This is live tutoring, homework help. We have about 60 sessions that happen every single year supporting student learning. Our Gale resources, a lot of like geography, biographies, really a go-to um, solid resource. And then for the younger kids, it's book flicks. So these are stories that are animated. They're available in English and Spanish. And this is just a group of really happy computer users and library um, folks from Eureka Valley, our kids. And with that, I just want to call up Kevin Truitt. He is Chief of Family and Student Services. Um, he's definitely, been, he was a legend before I became um, familiar with him about, he's really the can-do library man um, and our, our champion for in so many projects from Scholar Card and early days of really connecting our teacher librarians and our youth librarians. So I am just really honored that he is joining me today to offer some of his stories and reflections before he retires in December. So, <laughs> Mr. Truitt. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me this evening. This is a very special privilege um, for me. And I do want to say um, that I really i am thrilled to be here. I am so, so, so impressed by all that you do for our students. I'm very enthusiastic about this. Now, there's one thing that you need to know is um, that I actually oversee the department where all the counselors report to, social workers, nurses, clinicians, um, psychologists. I have nothing to do with the librarians. There's someone else. <laughs> but, um, but whenever something about the libraries comes up, I lean into that because libraries are extremely special to me. I have a little story I'm going to tell you. Um, and, um, <clears throat> but the partnership over the years, I have to say that um, it's so great to see the summer reading list again. We had talked about that many years ago, that that would be very helpful, and to see that actually happening um, for now a couple years, that's really, really, really important. The scholar card is very, very exciting. The teacher card is very, very exciting. So all that you do in partnering with our school site librarians, but also in providing the opportunities for our students to actually access the reading materials that they need um, outside of their school, but also inside of their school and connecting with our, our teachers and our librarians is very, very important. So I can't thank you enough for all that you do, and especially to Christy, Michael, Michelle, a bunch of people that I wanted to just say thank you for everything that you did. So I'm gonna leave you with a little story, okay? So why me, why librarian? Why libraries and why a library special to me? Okay, so it's a little personal, but it's okay. I've shared this before, so it's okay. Um, so I grew up outside of Boston, and um, and my home when I was when I was young it was a very very abusive home. My dad was very very abusive to my mom, and um, he. I was very violent. I actually don't have a memory of him not beating up my mom, so it was really, really bad. And so um, when I started school, no kindergarten, because our little town didn't have a kindergarten, so I started in 1967. I started in first grade and went to school, and I didn't know what school was. I could not adapt to a classroom. All I knew is that my parents got divorced, but he's probably found her right now, and he's probably going to go home, and he's probably going to kill her this time. I don't know. So it was very traumatic for me, so I acted up a lot. They didn't know what to do with me. I ran out of the classroom. So clearly, I had. they just labeled me that I had a learning disability, and I took home a 
letter one time to my mom, and I showed it to her in the kitchen. She started to cry, and I didn't know what I had done, but I did something really bad. And so she, um, she told me I was going to go to a special school. And so I was sent to the Bennett School. It was 1967. So the Bennett School had a nice sign outside of it. It, was a whole, it wasn't a different classroom in the school. It wasn't a special ed classroom. It was a whole other school across town. And a little yellow van picked me up and took me there. And outside the Bennett School said the Bennett School for the Retarded. So I was labeled retarded in 1967. And, um, and I went there for all of first and second grade. Okay, everyone from the housing project, we lived in a housing project. When my, when my mom finally got divorced, we moved to a low-income housing project where there's a lot of you know, things going on. Um, and so finally, at the end of second grade, I just wanted to go to the regular school that everyone went to. Um, and so finally, I got a letter that I was, I was going to go to Lancaster Street School, where everyone in the project went to school. I was going to the regular school. But... Every kid in the project knew that I was retarded because they had been calling me that for years. So I thought, oh my God, I'm going to third grade. How, what is this regular school going to be like? This is the same school that kicked me out in first grade. So now I'm going back there in third grade. So I meet my third grade teacher and she tells us on the first day, she has this train track all around the classroom. I might get really emotional right now. And so... We all, all the students have a train at the beginning of over here in the classroom. We all have our own train. And there's tracks around the classroom. And she says that we're going to have a reading competition. And that we are going to, every time we read a book and we do a book report with her and we meet with her and she asks us questions about the book that we read, our train will move one space. And I thought, wow. So she didn't know. but. I love reading, and I spent all kinds of time in the library. So this was my opportunity. I said, you're actually going to let me show you how much I read? Oh, my God. So this is my opportunity to show this class that I'm not retarded, that I'm actually. So I, I just dove into this. Well, I can tell you that before anyone crossed the first wall, I finished the whole <laughs> And the whole class was amazed, and they were like, you're the smartest kid here. You read everything. And I always, because I loved, loved, loved our library. It was our refuge. I could dive into books. I could pretend I was somewhere else. I could pretend that what was happening at home wasn't happening. When I was very, very young, I read much older books. People were very impressed. You're reading that book? That's, that's for much older kids. I love that people said that. So I feel like I owe my education and my confidence in my own academia and, and kind of crossing this path where I had so much to prove to my local library in Lemonster, Massachusetts really kind of saved me and saved my education. So that's why when I hear about libraries and I encourage students to go to library and really, really, really participate as much as you can because I feel like I owe my, my career to the, the library saving my, my education. So that's my little story for you and my appreciation for all that you do and my sincere gratitude and thanks for everything that you do for the students of San Francisco. So thank you. Thank you, Christy, and thank you so much, Kevin, for the partnership. And congratulations on your retirement. Thank you. We're going to move into our public comment. Um, we have um, both Christy and Dr. Truett available to be able to respond to any of your questions or comments. Peter Warfield, Executive Director of Library Users Association. It's good to see the uh, that there are efforts to encourage folks to use the library and enjoy the library. Uh, I wish I had heard a little more about books. I'm very grateful to Mr. Truitt for focusing on books in his experience. Um, some of the things we have in libraries today don't exist, didn't exist at that time or in my time when I was a kid. Um, so uh, I'm only concerned that uh, one of the things that the library, that I value in a library, and I think other people value in a library, is the independence from other agencies and other institutions. Uh, the idea that the library is there for each individual, for me as a person, um, the, uh, your prize-winning children's librarian who you have a lecture series named lecture series named after uh, always felt that there should be a very strong connection 
between the library and each individual child, and that there shouldn't be, for example, group signups, that the child should understand that the primary relationship is with the library, the librarians, and that that was a kind of sacred connection independent of uh, any other institution, including schools. Uh, one of the things that we have never heard anything about with respect to the scholar card, except I think that I brought it up delicately, is that the scholar card does for the scholar card holders exactly what we have been talking about for years with respect to fine and fee-free service. Uh, as you heard but didn't read, the scholar card doesn't charge the holder for fines or fees. And it was mentioned several times as a big deal by some of the kids in that announcement. Those who don't have a scholar card, for one reason or another, and apparently a third at least of the students in San Francisco don't have it, they are not relieved of paying fees, and that only underscores our concern and the importance and the value of having a fee-free system. What I am concerned about is we have also said we don't want a rip-off system. We want some accountability for lost materials. So I think that I haven't heard anything about any consequence for losing materials, and I'd be very interested in what the library's experience is with respect to lost materials. We don't want stuff getting lost and just leaving with no consequence, no concern. We certainly want it to be a, a non-money thing, so that's a question I have. What has the library done and what has the what have the schools done with respect to understanding about lost materials? Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment? Seeing that there's none, I'm going to um, move into our commission discussion on the San Francisco Public, um, uh, San Francisco Unified School District's partnership with the San Francisco Public Library. And um, I invite uh, any commissioners for any questions and or comments um, that you have um, for our presenters. Commissioner Mall. Um, thank you both for really a great, great presentation. And Kevin, I didn't think your story was a small story. I thought it was a really big story. Uh, what did you say? Just a big story. Big story. Yeah, yeah. It's really impactful. Um, and one I think the library needs to retell anonymously. But it's such a good story. <laughs> um, and I'm so happy that you were able to win the uh, train race. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, are the library books in the schools owned by the school or the SFPL? It's a uh, school district. Um, sorry, school district. In the blue. Mm -hmm. And can the school, do the schools, so they buy their own books? They have a budget, yes. Every school? I'm not sure how it's, yeah. you know how it's coordinated? So the Public Education Enrichment Fund, we have a library services um, portion of PEEF funding, and part of that is for the librarian's um, salary and benefits, and part of it is for direct materials to the library. And then before we had the PEEF, as a school principal, you had to dedicate a certain percentage of your budget to your library for um, just updating the library. And so a certain percentage, um, you're an elementary school and you probably have a, um, for all the salary and benefits, you know, once you pay your salary and benefits and materials budget becomes very, very small. But if you have for materials within the school, you have $40,000, then about 10% of that, $4,000, you'd want to put to your library book. So there's a certain guidance that we give principals about how much. When PEEF came along, now it's built into your pl your baseline, your, your um, the, the foundation for, um, for how much will go to library materials. So the libraries and the schools are um, the school district employees, not the public libraries employees. They are school district employees, yes. And just out of curiosity, do they have to be, do they have to have degrees in library sciences? Yes, they do. They do. They're fully credentialed, yes. Is there much trade-off between um, school Librarians and SFPL librarians? Trade-offs? 
occasionally get really lucky and have some go to public. And then sometimes we have some of our staff want to go to the school district. So we definitely see some overlap there and their career decisions. Yeah. So when you get your teaching credential, your library services credential is an additional credential. Hmm. Interesting. Um, it, I'm sorry, but I didn't get everything that the students said. So could you just um, tell me again what the difference between a regular library card is and a scholar card? Oh, that's a great question. It is basically the same. It's full access library card. It waives all the, um, the fines, and, fines fees. and fees is that if, the they, only if they are pre-existing. And children, youth cards have no fines on them, overdue fines. So it really is um, catching them up and giving them a new opportunity for the library. So when the statistic shows that, say, a third of students haven't, it just means they haven't checked any books out of the library, it right? It means they haven't activated their account, but right. they have a scholar card that's not activated yet. And as soon as it is activated, then they join all the benefits of the scholar card, which any student can do at any time. And the, I got it that the teachers can take out 100 books. With their teacher card. With their teacher mm -hmm. card. Mm -hmm. But the scholar card it's is like us. 50, just like, 50, yes. Like yes. any library user. Okay. I just want to jump in real quick and emphasize the great partnership. And one of the transformational aspects of the Scholar Card was sharing data, which is no small feat. And three years ago, through Christie's hard work, the partnership with Kevin and uh, our, our respective IT uh, staff, we were able to transfer the school directory. Uh, a data set of the entire K through 12 student body directly into our library patron database. And so that way we can ensure 100% of all SFUSD students had a library account uh, here waiting for them. Now, naturally over the years, many SFUSD students got a library account and that's where that 35% uh, still exists. Some people may have had their account, they're perfectly happy with it, but the Scholar Card, as Christy mentioned, allowed lots of young people to get a clean slate. And, and now they have the Scholar Card ac account. You're right, Michael. And I will just add that it includes the preschoolers with SFUSD as well. And it truly is like a marketing campaign to re-engage students and their families at the public library. That's why we've seen such a high yield in usage. And also on our staff's end, really a high-touch model of engaging with the teacher, the principal, the secretary, all the gatekeepers, so they know about the public library. It's a resource for them and the students. Great. Uh, any further um, comments? Yes, Commissioner? Uh, yes, uh, I enjoy the program. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering, the, uh, when you say the impact, that appears to me to be the participation rate rather than really the impact per se. Are there any measures that can actually uh, uh, correlate with the impact, either academic or non-academic? I love your story about reading all the advanced grades. That, to me, is sort of an example of the impact, so to speak, in your wonderful personal story. So are there any other impact that you would consider measuring or over the past five decades that have ever been tried? I will, we're witnessing one right now, increased engagement with students around summer learning and participation in our Summer Stride program. Many of those are SFUSD students. So we've seen that. We also collect um, kind of transformational stories that happen from the front line. Um, there's one story from a couple of years ago from Paul Revere School. There was a, a student who fled Guatemala with his family. And um, ooh, it's going to be hard not to cry. Um, but basically, through the Scholar Card, he got his, his library card. It was access to all the books he wanted to check out. And he carried his card against his heart around like it's a necklace. So there are these small moments that make a difference. And they're also the ones that happen every day at the library. You forgot your library card? Oh, do you go to, to SFUSD? Yes, I go to Buena Vista. Oh, you have a library account. You can get on the computer right now. 
You know, it's those moments that make the difference. They might be there with their caregiver who doesn't have a card, or they might be there with their, their camp group, um, and we could just provide that instant access to resources. That's invaluable, and that's something we couldn't do four years ago. So we'd love to track it with like yeah. student outcomes yeah. as well, but for now we're, we're taking these stories and really holding them and believing that they're making a difference. I would just add that I think that um, now that we have the scholar cards activated and we have a, we have a, um, an actual list of students that we know who have activated their accounts, it's very easy for us to look at those students who have activated and compare them, um, compare their academic achievement, maybe their attendance at school, compare other school engagement. Yeah. Um, that's something we can do. Um, you know, we, we can share that list and come up with a, you know, a, a data sharing agreement to actually measure some other impacts too. So it's a conversation that I'd certainly be willing to have before December and um, <laughs> get something on the books to get something happening before December. <laughs> we have a lot of data sharing that we do with our partners in the city. Clearly with DCYF and our DCYF funded programs, impact is very, very important. So um, we're sharing data constantly. We have our wellness programs at our high schools. They're very, very important, all funded um, through the city, through DCYF. And we have a wellness initiative school health data set. It's called WISH. And it records every single time um, a student has had a touch point with wellness, whether they're there for um, you know, vaping, um, whether they're there for um, um, reproductive um, advice, whether they are for drug abuse, whether they're there for all the sensitive things that they're there for. We don't acknowledge the student, but we do knowledge, acknowledge from every single high school what kids are activating wellness and what are the issues that they're activating wellness about. We can do things like that with data share. Yeah, I look forward to that because that is so much more powerful in expressing the impact and how impactful is really the kind of a program that put into place. Another question that I have is about uh, the students that activated and the student that did not activate. Are there any comparison to look into what it takes to see that those students who do not activate can have similar, uh, will have similar kind of an impact? Or outcomes. Or outcomes. And, and that's what I think would be beneficial by looking at the data in a deeper way, because we can compare the non-activated -active, students to the activated students, present that information to our schools, to our teachers. That can certainly encourage, you know, parents could see that data and say, oh, well, it's actually making a difference. I need to activate, you know, the library is making a difference. We know that it is. We know that it is. Um, but to have some hard data to be able to showcase, um, it would be very important, I think. I totally uh, encourage that. Because we Thank do, you. as I mentioned wellness, and not to keep going on this part of it, but um, we do know that students who, again, activate wellness and have a higher dosage, have a higher attendance, um, they have higher self-image. So even though they're going to wellness for some really deep issues and they're admitting, you know, I, I got a problem with this, they actually have higher school engagement, higher attendance, their GPA goes up when they start going to wellness and they have a higher dosage. Because um, we were also measuring that kids that are going in wellness are, are, you know, they're just spending all their time in wellness and their academics go down and it's all become about the schools become a clinic and they're not academic anymore, but we're seeing that that is actually not the case. Students pay more attention to their academics and do better in school when their dosage and wellness goes up. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lee. Commissioner Wolf? Thank you. That was a quite inspiring presentation, and it's clearly probably just the tip of the iceberg of what you actually do on a daily basis. And I think you're way too young to retire, so I think... <laughs> I think, you know, there's another future for you in the world of libraries. Um, but I, I, I think what I found really interesting and very inspiring is that notion, not only of the partnership in an ongoing way, but recognizing that the school libraries close in the summer and that the local library continues that experience. And I love that that be, it, it sounds like you really try and make that as seamless as possible. So while a student may really thrive on their school library, that then they have something to continue with and 
do the train around the track one more time in the summer when um, they don't have access to their, their school library, which is so convenient for them. So I really appreciate that way in which you, you're thinking of the partnership. Um, I also just want to, I had one question to ask, which is um, if you're a graduating senior and you have had your scholar's uh, library card, do you automatically become then a regular library card member? How do you, you're, in a sense, you're teaching these kids that this is a resource, it's lifelong learning for them, and this is a resource for them for the rest of their lives. So how do you ensure that it continues? I think that's a great question, and it's something we're really interested in our TAE youth, uh, which you will hear more about uh, later on in the commission. But just because they're, they graduate from high school, they still have a library card. It continues, so there's a little automatic switch to adult status mm -hmm. versus a teen status, but it's seamless on, right. on the user's end. Really great to hear. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Wong? Um, thank you so much for the presentation, as always. Um, Commissioner Wolf actually um, sh shared a lot of my um, admiration I was going to share about the partnership, and just like looking at the way that Summer Stride is designed, for example, it mimics a lot of um, the, the details about what happens in the school's uh, schedule and on like down to the specific hour, for example, um, which I think is fantastic. Um, I, won't, I won't belabor the point, but um, Dr. Truitt, thank you for your service to our students and, and congratulations on your retirement. Mr. Dunn? <clears throat> I just want to congratulate you also, Dr. Truitt, uh, for your service and for your wonderful story that brings again to life why we do what we do. So I appreciate it. Thank you. I have, a, I have one more question. Um, does the scholar card, is it valid with private schools also? That's a great question. So this year... Christy, can you go speak into the mic? Oh. So that's a great question. We feel like we're ready to pilot with an independent <clears throat> school to learn how that works. It's worked really well with um, a data agreement with SFUSD, so we are going to test that out this year, and we'll be happy to report back on the success there. We definitely have independent schools waiting in the wings to do this. So um, I just want to say, as we wrap up this particular item, um, schools and libraries are the heart, heart line of, 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 of a children's and a teen's life um, in city, urban, and rural areas. And I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I want you to take to heart, Christy, some of the things that you heard the commissioner say, particularly around seeking more information to understand, to take what we already know but to be able to put some metrics around it, around impact, because San Francisco has an opportunity to not only model um, for the rest of the nation um, what um, the impacts of, of the relationship between public schools and public libraries, but I think that we also have a duty to do that. And so um, now is the time. Now is the time for us to be able to uh, show that impact. And so I think we really do need to move forward in understanding those the, those connections. So I'd encourage you and your team and your colleagues in both SFPL and, and uh, city schools to um, understand more what that is. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we're going to move on to item number three, which is our free, f our find free implementation discussion. This is a presentation on the status of eliminating overdue fines and forgiving outstanding overdue fine, overdue fine a liability. Thank you, President Wardell. Okay. With the mayor's signing of the fine free legislation this past Friday, the library achieved a significant milestone in our endeavor to become a fine free library system. The revisions to the library's fines and fees schedule and the forgiveness of outstanding overdue, overdue fines are now poised to take effect in the coming weeks. Library staff has prepared a report this afternoon with an update on the status of our efforts to eliminate overdue fines. Our chief of branches, Kathy Del Neo, has been taking the lead on this activity and she has prepared a report. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, commissioners. As Michael shared, my name is Catherine Del Neo and I'm the chief of branches for the library. I'm also the management team liaison to the circulation steering committee, which some members are here in the audience. They should raise their hands now behind me. And I appreciate this opportunity to provide information about the library's fine-free implementation. Back in January, 
you voted to eliminate overdue fines moving forward. In February, you voted to waive all previously accumulated overdue fines. In July, the Board of Supervisors approved the library's budget, including both the elimination of future overdue fines and the waiving of past fines. Just last week, Mayor London Breed enacted the most historic library fine legislation in San Francisco's history. And now, the library is poised to implement fine-free service on Monday, September 16th, 2019. The key messages we will communicate to the public around this important change are that the library will eliminate all overdue fines on September 16th, that we will waive all outstanding fines on patron records, and that we will simplify things for patrons by automatically renewing eligible items up to three times. Most importantly, we will communicate that the library is looking forward to restoring access to community members and welcoming them back to their library. Staff have been very busy behind the scenes. They've revised circulation notices, staff manuals, the intranet documents, and public-facing FAQs and public documents that we hand out at the public service desks that pertain to circulating items. All of those revised materials will be made live on September 16th. And now, my colleague Jamie Wong will share the work that her team has been doing on the Find Free Marketing Campaign. Jamie? Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Jamie Wong, and I'm the public relations officer here at the library. I have the pleasure of working with Kathy, Michelle Jeffers, um, our talented graphics team, and many, many others on the implementation of our Find Free marketing campaign. And today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of our goals, our target audiences, and a brief show and tell of the art direction that we're looking at. Okay, so we have several ambitious goals for the Find Free Marketing Campaign. First of all, we want to make sure that active current SFPL cardholders are educated on the changes to the circulation policy. Secondly, we want to make sure that we're reaching lapsed or welcoming back lapsed cardholders and giving, in, giving them the, it, the knowledge that um, we have high value and free resources at the library. So we want to definitely make sure we're achieving that. Um, lastly, we view this as a really important brand building opportunity for the library and to remind all communities that we are an institution with a powerful, powerful foundation of equity and continuing commitment to free and equal access. On this particular slide, you'll see that there are three icons. Um, there are active users who were singling as green, inactive users who were singling as gray, and red um, use red, which is indicating non-users. And this applies to the next slide, where I'm going to show you some of the marketing assets that we're proposing for this particular campaign. OK, so we have a lot of different ways that we're reaching out to our various audiences. First of all, for our current SFPL cardholders, we have flyers planned with FAQs. Um, and these will be available in the main library as well as all branch libraries. Um, to help people understand our new um, find free model. Um, secondly, we will be updating our library card registration booklet for new card holders, your SFPL. Um, to broaden our reach, we plan a banner for the main atrium and outdoor banners for our branches. And we think this will help amplify the message. Um, we plan some posters for community partners and agencies to also post. So we're making sure that the word gets out even more into neighborhoods. And lastly, we will be marketing this and promoting this through our At The Library e-newsletter and newsletter. Via our digital channels, we have several plans in place. First of all, we will create a landing page with um, the FAQs prominently posted, so everyone is educated on that if they are visiting. We'll have a call out on our SFPL homepage, which is pointing to the Find Free landing page. Um, and we will mount a social media marketing campaign. Lastly, we will, be we will be committing ourselves to a segmented e-blast marketing campaign in which we are reaching out with targeted messaging to different audiences to make sure that they all are aware of this move and, um, and that they are welcome now to take out books with, um, with no fines. Lastly, we have several external channels that we are planning to employ to reach out even further. 
um, mostly to non-users, which is one of the most value, valuable audiences that we're hoping to find. First of all, we plan a PSA and a press release. Um, and secondly, we are hoping that we will do an informational mailer, um, which will star some of our visually stunning graphics, um, as well as information about the library that will be intriguing to everyone, a map of all the branches, um, library hours, and also a real spotlight on some of the programs that make the, this particular library unique and valuable to all, such as our Drag Queen Story Hour, Night of Ideas, our e-resources, some of those things that people, when they say to us, doesn't the library just have books, which my father-in-law just said to me the other day. And I said, no, let me tell you. And then I proceeded to talk his ear off. Um, <laughs> but basically, this is a way for us to tell, you know, to broadcast to many folks that the library is not the place that you knew 20, 25 years ago. It's a dynamic and changing place. So we have actually done several developmental phases in developing this marketing campaign. First, we did a comp research um, phase where we looked at our peers find forgiveness campaigns. The good news, of course, is that there are so many different libraries across the country who are going in this way. So we had a lot to look at. Um, here on the slide, you can see that there is just a sampling from some of our neighbors, Oakland and Alameda, and then a little bit farther afield, Denver and Dallas. Um, what we found is that the messaging really just ran the gamut. And ultimately, we wanted to focus on our key goals and to speak to the uniqueness of the spirit of San Francisco. So I'm pleased to share with you the tagline, which has spoken to so many staffers already, and I hope that you feel the same. Our tagline is fabulously fine free, and we are particularly excited about this because it is memorable, it feels impactful, it feels true to San Francisco, it, into San Francisco pride, and we also really want to elicit a spirit of joy and welcome and celebration. Lastly, of course, we want to lean into our past as being the library that started Drag Queen Story Hour, um, so there is a reference and a nod to that as well. Here you can see that there is a color palette um, that we are sharing, which is bright and welcoming. Um, we also have a logo and a Type treatment um, that is proposed here that we think will translate both into print and digital channels. And lastly, I have two different art directions to share with you today. The first one is fabulous line art. This is actually very on trend. It speaks to a lot of different audiences. It feels both classic as well as modern. Um, and you can see that we have a reference to the Golden Gate Bridge in there as well as um, some books. So a lot, of, um, a lot of staffers have already um, responded very positively to this particular direction. The second concept that we're looking at for fabulous, Fabulously Fine Free is a fabulous sunglass kind of idea. And we are particularly excited about this because it allowed us to really um, respect and to give a nod to the many different neighborhoods that our branches, um, that our branches are in. So not only does it celebrate the sense of unity amongst San Francisco, but it also gives a nod to all of these different places that we are particularly proud of. On the left side, you will see that it is, there is just the sunglasses, and you can see some of those familiar vistas that San, Francisco, San Franciscans are so proud of and love. And on the right side, we are also implementing some iconography of resources and services um, so, to remind, so as to remind people of what we offer here at the library. Um, we think that this will speak to a really wide demographic, and we want to celebrate the spirit of inclusion and to lightly message, we see you um, with these sunglasses and that everything is reflected in, you know, like you're looking out into these different neighborhoods. Um, I hope that you feel inspired by some of our graphics campaign. Thank you so much, and I hope, you, uh, I hope that you are feeling fabulously fine for you today. We just want to thank everyone on staff who's worked on this project. This is a non-inclusive list. I'm sure there are folks who have done great work on this who um, have been behind the scenes even more. But these are the folks who have been working really hard. We have a group called the Auto Renewal Fine Free Group, and that's a subset of our Circulation Steering Committee. And they are listed, our public affairs folks are behind the scenes, um, IT support, some web services. And we just really are grateful for all the work that staff have put into this and how collaborative they've been and how they've really found a lot of joy in revising manuals. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you.
Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Jamie, and thank you, library commissioners, for your leadership and support of this policy direction. So at this time, I'll call public comment on this fabulously fine free agenda item. Peter Warfield, Executive Director of Library Users Association. Sounds like uh, an entertaining and uh, lively campaign. Uh, I believe uh, the city librarian could thank us as well for our lobbying efforts with him personally as well as with the commission and uh, I dare say with the stink that we made in other places to educate people about what the library was not doing, which is what you show in your uh, timeline is happening in February. I believe that's an error, and I believe that you did uh, as a commission vote in March. Uh, I'm not sure, but I believe that it was in March that you voted to remove the fines on the books. One of the things I've mentioned before, and I think it's very important, is who are you trying to reach, and how are you trying to reach them, and is it effective? So the first thing that I'm concerned about is that the, um, there's some vagueness about, for example, on the preparation page, public-facing FAQs. Don't know what that really means. What I found very concerning was that for folks who are not coming to the library, there was no direct notification at all. The library knows who the inactive folks are uh, and the active ones, but for example, if you're looking for a letter, or if you're looking for a notification with a letter notification of materials reserved are available now, it's waiting for you at the library. Not a word. One of the senior staff, uh, senior management people told me, well, we're not advertising it in the libraries, which would include anybody who walks into the library, whether they intend to borrow or not. There was absolute void of publicity of any kind with respect to the fine-free period we've had since, what, around April? Not a word. Now, there was on the website a very tiny type notice, but what if you don't go on the website? What if you don't have a computer at home or go there? What if you go to the library and you go to the website? Uh, certainly, if you don't go to the website, you would know nothing even if you came regularly to the library. Now, I'm glad to see that there are things like uh, uh, materials available. I think the marketing assets indicate some of that, but I don't see direct contact with people through whatever means they had to communicate with the library. And the poorest people, the ones without computers, the ones who may only be getting letters, get apparently nothing. Apparently the email is working, maybe, I don't know if it's going directly to former and current users, but there should be a direct contact with everybody the library knows is or was a user to tell them, hey, it's fabulously fine, free, and they could even Thank use you. the more, another term as well. Further public comment? Seeing that there's none, we're going to move into our uh, commission discussion on the fine free implementation. I'd like to invite my commissioners, uh, Commissioner Wong. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I just had one question, which was, um, first of all, I love the spelling out of exactly what marketing assets we're, we're deploying. I am curious, um, you know, especially for the channels that are external. So I was talking specifically about things like the transit shelter ads. Um, it says. Uh, TBC here, but just assuming that's actually happening. Um, do we have a rough, are we on a neighborhood by neighborhood level distributing marketing spend differently? Because I remember from the um, long overdue report, you know, we knew that the Bayview neighborhood was, um, you know, most impacted by, um, uh, by, by fines. Um, and so I'm curious, kind of, are we tying our uh, marketing strategy and deployment of marketing spend against kind of the patterns that we saw by neighborhood. 
Thank you for that question. That's an excellent question. Um, absolutely. We are planning an informational mailer and we're working closely with the research strategy and analytics team to identify, um, to actually nail down um, uh, addresses and to send out a, a mailer that is all about find free and how um, we are doing away with that, as well as welcoming people back and saying, these are all the resources. These are incredible. You know, come on in. This is your local branch. Perfect. Thank you. Further uh, commission comments or questions? Commissioner Wolf. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it's so easy for us to sit up here and vote to do something, but actually to make it happen takes an enormous amount of effort and skill and dedication in addition to your daily job. So I just want to thank you for your leadership and the whole a library really embracing this because it, I know it is not easy to actually really make it happen and, and hopefully make it seamless for people to walk in and on, on September 16th and make it work. Um, I, I just wanted to um, sort of touch base on what Commissioner Wong had said about the neighborhood distinction. I mean, these three different target groups that you um, identified require very different language, material. Um, I mean, sometimes I even think, like, what is fine free? Like, I don't even know what that phrase, so we have this phrase, fabulously fine free, but I'm not even sure everybody really understands what that means. So I, I just hope you will be really um, attentive to developing materials that are really targeted for those different audiences because the, the audience that I care so deeply about is that middle to gray audience that um, has stopped using it because they, they have fines that they can't um, cover. Um, and then I'm just going to channel my fellow commissioner to my left <laughs> and say that this is a great moment to start um, really thinking as, as this launches a really great way of gathering statistics about what's working, what's not working, and even gauging the marketing dollars to what's really happening in the turnaround. And I really hope that you'll uh, report back to us on how it's actually doing. Thank you, commissioner. So um, the, the final thing that I'll, I'll say before we move on from this agenda item is that you've, um, there's a great appreciation for this work. We think that the, clearly the, uh, the marketing uh, materials um, are important, um, feedback on ensuring that there's uh, enough specificity um, that's targeted um, with the um, goal of, of, of looking at it from an equity lens to ensure that we're addressing those gaps um, and past histories. And last but not least, to continue to understand um, the impact. And you can only understand that by um, gathering data. So with our new data resources uh, area that we have with, I believe it's Randy, I think, uh, we need to continue to understand. So le definitely leverage all those internal resources. Thank you both to uh, Jamie and to Kathy. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to agenda number four in our city librarians report um, on recent library activities and for our city librarian to make announcements. Thank you, President Wardell. We have a number of presentations this evening and I am pleased to introduce our first presenter. Paula Haney is a librarian in our General Collections and Humanities Center on the third floor, and she has been heading up our efforts to serve transitional age youth. Paula? Uh, hi, thank you so much for having us. Uh, I'm, like Michael said, I'm Paula Heaney, Tay Librarian on the third floor, and I'm here to introduce uh, Tay Services at the library. Uh, so, who are Tay? Tay stands for Transitional Age Youth. This term was first used to describe youth transitioning out of foster care, but now it has come to represent all 18 to 25 year olds who are facing significant barriers to becoming stable adults. These might be youth who are just as involved, unhoused, or marginalized in other ways. A survey of houseless 18 to 25 year olds in San Francisco revealed that over half of them identify as LGBTQIA and 64% identify as people of color. At the last point in time count in January this year, over 1,000 of the 8,000 unhoused people in SF were Tay. Many of these youth have experienced at least one form of serious trauma, sometimes several. 88% of youth who have lost their homes 
report physical, emotional, and or sexual abuse within the home before they left it. So in an effort to equitably serve our community's most vulnerable young people, SFPL became the first library in the country, as far as we know, to launch an official TAY services program. Library administration assembled a TAY task force, whose first step was to hold a focus group of TAY, ensuring that everything we do is informed by the youth themselves. The next step was to create guidelines for a TAY advisory board so that TAY have an ongoing voice. As we move forward, the TAY task force will augment the work of the TAY team by identifying opportunities for connection, working across departments to implement Fulton Room improvements, and continue to provide thoughtful and compassionate ideas. Uh, the TAY team is made up of Alice Chan, the third floor manager, me, and our newly hired TAY public service intern, Gabriela Ruiz Martinez. Right here. Um, so we've developed a two-pronged approach to TAY services. First, within the library, we will hold space for TAY with a weekly drop-in program called TAY Lounge. Uh, featuring crafts and snacks, this will be a casual space for TAY to experience safety and build community. Uh, our intern, Gabby, will act as peer liaison to build trust. She will also lead the TAY advisory board and is currently recruiting applicants if you know of any potential candidates. The TAY task force will, among other things, help to transform the Fulton meeting room into a cozy, TAY-friendly space. On the other hand, we recognize that TAY are grappling with intense life events and might not think to come to the library when they're just trying to figure out where to sleep tonight. Therefore, we will go to them. We'll perform outreach to register TAY for library cards and show our friendly faces, and we'll partner with service organizations to complement the work they already do with our abundance of library resources. We've already begun a partnership with First Place for Youth, which is an organization that provides free housing and adulting skills to TAY exiting foster care. And over a, month of, over a series of monthly customized workshops, we'll teach their TAY about library resources, uh, early literacy tips for young parents, cooking and nutrition basics, and whatever else they want. Uh, we also had a really fabulous event just last week, an opening celebration for our Creating Resilience Art Exhibit in partnership with the Larkin Street Youth Services. Larkin is the biggest TAY service provider in the city and offers housing, health clinics, skill building classes, and a very successful art program. We're very proud to be working with Larkin to showcase the amazing art of our city's Tay right here in the library. It's upstairs on the third floor right now if you wanna check it out. Uh, the celebration event featured an introduction to the library's Tay services, a history of Larkin's art program, an inspirational keynote speaker, and best of all, a panel of the young artists who spoke to making art while at the same time overcoming trauma and hardship. A packed audience of Tay service providers and members of the public helped this event and the ongoing exhibit boosts our three goals of positioning the library as a safe and welcoming space for Tay, building partnerships with other service organizations, and promoting visibility of this demographic within the library and the community at large. Uh, this initiative would not be possible without generous funding from the Friends of the San Francisco Public Library, and we're grateful for the ongoing support from library administration. Uh, we thank the Tay Task Force members, especially Shauna Sherman, for their brilliant ideas and can-do attitudes, and a very special thank you to the Tay we've met who have opened our hearts and taught us so much already. Please look forward to hearing more about this program. Thank you. Thank you, Paula, and welcome, Gabriella. All right, our next presenter is Michelle Jeffers, our Chief of Community Programs and Partnerships. She has an exciting announcement about our partnership with the San Francisco Giants. Hi, commissioners. I'm Michelle Jeffers, Chief of Community Programs and Partnerships for San Francisco Public Library. And even though the Giants may be in the cellar of the National League right now, <laughs> they have one thing going for them, and that's a brand new Giants library card. <laughs> <laughs> For many years now, the Giants have been a generous donor, of course, to our Summer Stride program. They always give us hundreds of tickets to share, raffle off to families through that program. And for the past five years, we've also been the featured partner at the Giant, Junior Giants Community Day, which is happening this Sunday at, at Oracle, I can't get used to that, Oracle Park. Children from throughout Northern California um, get to join a Giants team and have some reading goals and they get to come to Oracle Park and run the bases and go through different stations and meet a Giants player. And this year, 
we, we've always given them a book. They get to take home a book that is donated by the library to them. This year, they can also sign up for a San Francisco Giants library card. Um, so we'll be launching the Giants card exclusively at this event on Sunday at Oracle Park. On Monday, it will be available to, for the general public to enjoy, to obtain as a new or replacement card. And then on Monday, August 26, we'll be the featured community partner at the Giants versus D-backs game at Oracle Park. So we'll have a, an all-star mighty outreach team there signing people up at the Giants game for library cards. And we'll have a PSA, a public service announcement on the big screen at that game. Um, as you know, last year we launched a Warriors card. And so far today, we have more than 33,000 patrons who have a uh, Golden State Warriors card, so we think the Giants card will do very well, if only the Giants would pick it up a little bit. <laughs> um, so go Giants, thank you for your time. Thank you, Michelle, very <laughs> exciting. It is now my sincere pleasure to share a major personnel announcement regarding our Chief Operating Officer recruitment. I'm pleased to announce the appointment of Maureen Singleton into the role of Chief Operating Officer for the San Francisco Public Library. Yay. Yes. <laughs> As you know, Maureen has been serving very capably since March of 2018 as the Acting Chief Operating Officer. And in this recruitment, Maureen clearly distinguished herself from a national pool uh, a strong pool of applicants from across the country, and she is deeply committed to public service and the mission of the San Francisco Public Library. Uh, the library is extremely fortunate to have Maureen in this leadership capacity, so congratulations, Maureen. And now I'd like to introduce our next presenter, who is <laughs> Maureen Singleton, our Chief <laughs> Operating Officer, with an update on the FY 2021 budget. Great. So before I give you the highlight on the budget, I just really wanted to extend my thanks for the opportunities I've had working at the library. I've held different roles over my many, many years here. It's been a privilege. I am a deeply dedicated public servant, so I'm um, honored to continue in this role of working for the library. And I'm excited to work along all these amazing people to make a difference in our society. So thank you for this opportunity and thank you for your support. So with that, I will roll into the exciting update of our budget. So the last time we talked about the budget was in June and um, I created this PowerPoint right before I left for Europe. So I hope I remember everything because I just got back the other day and I'm a little jet lagged still. So to give you just um, a high level look at our budget, the way it shook out after the budget negotiations with the Board of Supervisors in June was that our fiscal year 20 budget sits at $171.6 million. And that funds approximately 701 full-time equivalent FTEs. That's an increase of around $11 million over the prior year budget for fiscal year 19 with an additional five FTEs. You may recall that what we had discussed was that is the movement or creation of custodial positions within us and the elimination of a work order with the real estate department. And then the fiscal year 21 budget rests at $168.9 million. The proposed reductions from the board's analyst office represent less than 1% of the mayor's proposed budget. Those amounts for fiscal year 20 and 21 are 424,500 and 547,000. Those are detailed in your attachment too, but they're also listed out here. And as I mentioned in June, when we first discussed the reductions, really the target during the whole negotiation phase is to identify what cuts we can make because that is just part of the process in managing the budget and the negotiation phase, but targeting the cuts where it isn't gonna have a detrimental impact on the provision of services for the public. And everything that the commission had wanted in the budget in February was included with one exception as noted in attachment one, which is about the expansion of the health and safety services associates rather 
Uh, and that really was because the department that performs the, the contract was not able at this juncture to add that capacity. We will continue to figure out if there's another way that we can do that, if not this fiscal year, in future fiscal years. And hopefully my new contracts manager can help us identify a solution for that. So on a sources level, the majority of our budget comes from the annual allocation of the Library Preservation Fund. It's approximately around 94% of our total funding for fiscal 20, with about 5% coming from the use of the fund balance. And then for 21, it's about 96%, with fund balance being about 3%. And just a quick reminder that fund balance is prior year unspent property tax money of the two components of our library preservation fund, which is the general fund baseline and the property tax allocation. On the uses by type, the largest percent is our labor, and that counts, accounts for salary benefits and retiree health uh, care costs. So, and then depending on the fiscal year, the next highest percent can be capital, which is the case over the next two fiscal years, or collections. And, um, and those can, as I mentioned, de definitely oscillate based on what we're investing at any given time. But typically collections, if you look at just as operations and back out capital, which is a one-time expenditure, it's around 12% of our budget to 14%, depending on the fiscal year. And then the look by, um, by division for fiscal year 20, you can see the breakout for all of the various sections, with branches being the largest on the operating side. And there's a breakout here between the branch costs for youth services as well as adult services. And then another large category, of course, is capital, because as you know, we are doing major investments in the renovation and or replacement of three branches, Mission, Chinatown, and Ocean View. And then, of course, our collections and technical services is a large component of our budget, because that does include our collections budget. And then the last highlight for you is, we've already talked about some of it already, is the fine-free legislation was signed in. The mayor's office also signed the budget on August 1st, and uh, that also included the accept and expend of the Friends annual monies. And all of those are included as attachments for you and for the public. And that concludes my presentation. I am available if you have questions. And that concludes the City Librarian's report. Thank you very much, um, uh, Michael, for that City Librarian report. This time we're going to open it up for public comment on the City Librarian report, and then we'll move it into commission discussion and questions. Peter Warfield, Executive Director of Library Users Association. Uh, I don't know if Maureen just got a demotion. She's doing the same thing that she was doing all along. I'm expecting to come in one day actually and find her perhaps flying around the atrium or something now that she's been elevated and uh, will be doing spectacular things that we have never seen before. Um, I do want to say that with respect to her presentation, which was last year, I'm very disappointed that we don't have a specific, definite number for just plain collections. To say that collections and technical services, parens including collections, is, 20, is 25 million and, and so on and is 15%, blurs what actually the collections have been, and they have been hovering at times. They've gone lower than previous years rather than higher, despite increases in the budget. And as a percent of the budget, this library doesn't have 10 to 15 percent, or somewhere in the middle. It's my recollection that, in general, the collections, which means what you put out for the public 
including e-books, including books, including the other media and so on, is closer to 10% than it is to 15%. And that's a question. Why certainly isn't there the emphasis on books and materials that has been talked about over many years, which is 15%, especially for a wealthy library, uh, as ours is? And uh, why isn't it just shown specifically? That is what the library gives and puts out to the public that, of course, there are services and so on but, uh, and staff, but that is a key metric, if you like, measure that needs to be spa stated specifically by itself. With respect to the so-called partnership with the giants, I'm very concerned, as I've spoken before, about the library's independence and uh, the, for the public to know that the library is working for the public and not to sell and to glorify private businesses that are profit-making. Uh, maybe you want to partner with the Mitchell brothers and uh, partner with a porno movie place. How do you decide who you're going to partner with and who you're not going to partner with? And wait till the next scandal hits this particular partner. Are you going to pull out? Why should the library make partnerships? You can certainly cooperate with all kinds of folks and certainly, for example, schools, but why partner? Why not just keep independence? Thank you. Thank you. I am Marie uh, Sapella, uh, Executive Director of Friends of the Library. Um, you know, we're just really, I, and I've mentioned this to Michael and Maureen before, clearly, uh, certainly starting with the support of the Tay services and all of the challenges that the folks at the, the main library have around partially homed and homeless people and just people in, in real need of support. We uh, would love to explore uh, some way that we as a community might be able to participate in the possibility of getting the hasas. If there's a way that we can figure out um, either you know, in a collaborative way that we could be a part of possibly filling that, that gap for that need. Um, again, I don't know what that, that might involve. Um, and then- Marie, do you mind uh, uh, saying again, getting a what? The, the, what is the health, the things you couldn't get in the budget, right. sorry. Yeah, the health and safety right. associates. Sorry, yeah. the, yes, I was gonna ask you to, yes, the, the health and safety associates idea that couldn't get through um, the mayor and the board of supervisors whether there's a possibility for us um, to per, the, the, find a way to do that. And if anyone knows Daniel Lurie, if you can get him to call me, because I've been trying to talk to him as the head of Tipping Point, as two community agencies that might talk about um, the library and, and homelessness. Anyway, I'll cheat just a little in my role as a mother of two public school students. Thank you for everything. We got our scholar cards, we got our reading list, and that brain fuse is awesome. So thank you so much. <laughs> Further public comment? Okay, we're going to move into the uh, commission discussion of the city librarian's report, uh, which in, uh, includes the um, um, tape presentation, transitional age use, the San Francisco Giants library card, um, as well as the announcement of our, our new and permanent COO, Maureen Singleton, and um, the fiscal year 2021. Commissioner Wolf. Um, we just have to just say congratulations to you, Maureen, and thank you for your incredible service uh, as the interim, and now that you have this position, we're just, I'm just delighted, and I think you and Michael make a great partnership um, in really leading the efforts, um, so I just wanted to say congratulations. I also wanted to uh, extend a, a great uh, admiration and um, recognition to the Tay team. Um, to Paula, Alice, and Gabriella, it's really impressive what you have um, launched. Um, and um, um, I'm very curious, since it's a new program, how, what, what is your thought about how do you measure success? Hi, my name is Alice. I'm part of the Tay team. I'm I work here at the Main on the third floor as the floor manager. Um, first of all, congratulations, Maureen. <laughs> Um, so we did think long and hard, how do you measure such a fluid population? 
So for every gift library gift library cards that we give out at these outreach, we actually put a little um, term called TAY 2019 so we can see how many cards are being actively used. We are actually, and as um, Paula was mentioning, we are in, we tried to embed library services into a TAY service organization. We're actually meeting with the uh, person who we partner with um, to talk about how we how can we work more closely to measure the outcome of these partnerships. So we will be uh, report back soon. Great. Thank you. Sure. Wonderful. Thank you. Additional commissioner questions or comments on the city librarian's report. Uh, yes, I do have a, a, a question about hey, how did the idea come about? That's a really great question. So third floor is the floor who housed the collection of social show show um, issues and in addition to true crime and all the general humanities and we are also the floor to um, where patron goes. Um, patron goes once they enter into the library and actually it was one of our old librarian who used to work here, her name is Lane, and she started out this program called um, Sprightly, and um, you know, she brought it to my attention that you know, she's serving this particular group. It's, it's not quite youth, but not quite adults, and that's how I first learned about this, and um, I think at that point when I joined the library, when I joined the main library, the um, they already have the main task force form, and that's how we get really loop into this population. So our friends of a library got wind of it, and then they funded a part of it. Right. So we asked. We asked. Um, so Tom, and that this is where why we um, really thank the ongoing support of the library administration. We went up with this really new, brand new idea. This is kind of like out of the box idea, and they were they said just go for it, and here we are. Well, I commend you about the out of box because uh, clearly, I mean, for me, I look at parenting is a very important element, and when the young one goes through all this foster care home and may mm -hmm. not have what it is that we don't go through foster home with the kind of a parenting that we have. No. So you have so marvelously identified a very vulnerable sort of uh, population that hopefully the program would really uh, uh, have a very impactful one to this particular population. This is our hope too. Mm -hmm. But thank you. So on, on that note, I just uh, want to say that, uh, suggest that you give it some thought to uh, Connie's question about how to measure success. It may Absolutely. or may not be easy, but you may like to, I think, for the library, library has got the uh, design thinking hat on, mm -hmm. and perhaps some of mm -hmm. these things will come about to see how it is that you measure success. I, if I will allow my imagination go wild. Beat your head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 When this program is so successful, I can just see that, again, there may be something that the American Library Association would say, hey, San Francisco, we've got one of these. Can we uh, see, learn, get something going there as well? Because this is a population is so vulnerable. All over that, the United yeah, States. Not out of the box. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Ma. Um, Pleased to hear that you're working with Larkin Peer Services, continue right. with that wonderful organization. Thank you. So I will say, first of all, um, I, I want to, um, I agree about the vulnerability of the Tay population um, and the ways in which this group um, of uh, young adults, they're not children, they're not teens, right. so they're older teens sometimes, most of the time they're younger adults, right. they really are left on their own. 
and many times to fend in the world, and they still are developmentally um, growing and, and, and still maturing developmentally. Um, and so this is a really important program. One of the things, I, I have a question about the task force. Um, I see the charge, I see the members, I see the highlights. Mm -hmm. You know, task force oftentimes, you know, has a charge and it has kind of a beginning and an ending. So I'd be interested in knowing, uh, you know, how long is this task force going to be going on? How um, might this work then become deeply institutionalized within the uh, identity and the programs and, and the initiatives? Task force work usually turns into something else. Um, and so um, I'm not sure if that's something you need to report on right now, unless you need to, but I'd be interested in learning more about, you know, a task force doesn't last forever. So how then has this, uh, the task force work informed what the institution commits to and how does it show up in its work? And that's related to the impact and being able to um, 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 have some uh, metrics and measures around what the success look like. Definitely. That's excellent feedback, and typically in the fall, we have all of our committee chairs and task forces report out to the management team, and that's when we can evaluate their accomplishments from the prior year and also look forward to what goals we may have for the current fiscal year and beyond. And in some instances, task forces have become standing committees, and that's something that we can examine. Okay, thank you. Um, and last but not least, I just want to um, join the commission and on behalf of the commission, thank you so much, Maureen. Um, we look forward to our continued work together um, as you um, effectively uh, steward the resources as we are uh, attempting to steward it and inform us of the processes. So thank you so much. So we are going to move on to um, item number five. Uh, which is the approval of the minutes for June uh, 20th, 2019. And this requires uh, uh, action on behalf of the commission, and we will open it up uh, to uh, public comment. I think it requires action by the commission, not on behalf of the commission. Peter Warfield, Executive Director of Library Users Association. Some of these minutes are uh, incomprehensible to me, uh, but I will start with particulars. Uh, on the city librarian, on, well, let's start with agenda number one. And for those who think this is boring, this is where the library changes uh, and controls what is in the history of what has been going on and even what the public has said. And unfortunately, it's not always accurate. Uh, nor even fair. Um, with respect to my public comment on agenda item one, it says here, he said the library went against all of its own surveys with no evening hours added and some dropped. I didn't say the library went against its surveys. It went against what the patron survey results were. And that was that people wanted more evenings and more weekends. And instead, the library gave them zero more evenings, uh, if you count an evening starting at 6, and uh, actually took away 14 uh, times and places where there were evening hours and cut them. It's patron survey results, not the survey itself that the library uh, went counter to. With respect to city librarian's report, I said there was no cost mentioned in the presentation or the discussion with respect to the facilities projects. Not that there wasn't a budget discussed. It sounds like I was looking for details. I was looking for even a single gross number. No costs were mentioned or discussed with respect to the facilities projects update. With respect to Eureka Valley, first of all, it's the Eureka Valley Harvey Milk Branch. Second, I don't believe I said it was a hideous project, though I think that. I think I used the phrase anti-human. There are all kinds of ways in which that project focused on basically making homeless people scram, get out, go away. And even regular patrons who live in the neighborhood and are presumably a class that you respect more, 
also couldn't use the library as before, putting a fence in the middle of a little retaining wall that you used to be able to sit on and that somebody used to bring books that people could take along or read at the library, gone. Uh, seating under a nice tree before, you, before or after you uh, enter the library, gone. It's anti-human architecture. And as far as the price, I don't know why it says I want to see the cost for these. I know it's over $800,000 was spent on this abomination. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment? So, um, is there any discussion? Uh, well, seeing as we didn't hear any changes that materially changed the meaning of the minutes, uh, I move to approve the minutes as shown. I second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? So the minutes of June 20th, 2019 are approved. We're going to move to our final item, which is an adjournment. I'd like to call our uh, final public comment. Peter Warfield, Executive Director of Library Users Association. Um, whether you call it new business or whether you call it future uh, matters to be taken up, others, other groups, other commissions have that at the end. You used to have it at the end. You are cheating the public. You're not representing the public or even yourselves when you don't insist that this item be on every agenda at or near the end of the meeting so that you as individual commissioners who have been appointed to represent the public can say what you would like to have discussed or acted upon at future meetings. It's the only opportunity you would have to say anything like that with respect to a public statement of what you'd like on the agenda and what might concern you. Uh, when one of the commissioners said, uh, let's get a follow-up on results, that's a perfectly legitimate thing that you might want to say should be on a future agenda item. Almost any kind of question that you've had would be an item that you might suggest for a future agenda item, but you don't. And I think you're cheating the public if you adjourn without <laughs> insisting that that item or that sort of item that gives you voice and the public you represent voice, that that should be on every future agenda. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn the meeting. A second. All those in favor to adjourn, say aye. 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 All those opposed? This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>